Welcome everyone to the UCLA Longevity Center webinar, our Wednesday webinar. And today we have a very interesting talk and very relevant talk today with Dr. Mitra Hushmand on maintenance of a healthy brain in older adults, how lifestyle habits affect neural stem cell populations. So I'm very pleased to um, bring uh, Dr. Hushman to you. She has a, a PhD in neurobiology from um, UC Irvine. And uh, she's now currently working at the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And um, I will just invite Dr. Hushman to tell you a little bit more about herself and we can move, um, get going with our webinar. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Hushman. It's great to see you. Hello, thank you, Dr. Arcoli, and hello to everyone here. Um, before I begin the talk, just very quickly about um, how I even got connected with the Longevity Center and with Dr. Arcoli. Um, I used to teach up until just this past quarter, actually, I used to teach at UCLA. Um, and I used to teach a stem cell biology class in particular, and um, at the same time also did some uh, voluntary work with one of the student organizations on campus, Dialogue Society. And um, it was really through Dialogue Society that I got an opportunity to connect with the Longevity Center and more specifically with the Senior Scholar Program. And that's how I met um, Andy, who has just been a wonderful collaborator for Dialogue Society and through a number of different programs that uh, the students at Dialogue Society put together with the senior scholars. I've had the opportunity to meet some amazing senior scholars and uh, I'm just always inspired by them. Um, I ran uh, yoga classes with them on Saturday mornings. Uh, some of you, I already see your names and the participants list. Um, and while I'm adjusting to a new job that I've taken up, um, I've put a pause on those yoga classes, but I will go back to them and look forward to hopefully having more of you guys joining there. So that's just a brief um, background of how I got connected. But today we're here because I'm talking, I'm putting my uh, sort of graduate school and postdoc hat back on to talk to you a little bit about the effect of lifestyle habits on uh, neural stem cell populations. And that's primarily because that's really, it was my bread and butter during grad school. I uh, did my PhD in neurobiology. So my interest was always in how the nervous system operates. I find the brain and the spinal cord to be absolutely fascinating and complicated, um, but also because of a personal interest in health and probably some major interest in wanting to stay young <laughs> for as long as I can. I really try to understand the evidence behind how the brain can stay young. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about what I, what I found in terms of uh, lifestyle habits to be very effective evidence-based methods for uh, longevity. And, and I heard Dr. Hushman that you're really 90 years old. <laughs> That's great. And we know that you practice what you preach. So sure. Let, let's go with that. <laughs> it helps the talk. That's for sure. Um, okay. Any, um, any logistical things that we need to tell people, Linda, before I get started, I can start. Sharing I, th I think we're great, except to, to reinforce that, that uh, people who do get involved with our senior scholars program, this is a program where uh, people who are not part of the UCLA student body can become part of the UCLA st student body through auditing undergraduate classes with professors for half price. And uh, we are doing this virtually. And then um, Dr. Hushmand and Andy, who, um, who Dr. Hushmand mentioned, uh, Andy runs other cool activities associated with the senior scholars and Dr. Hushmand has been part of the Dialogue Society and a collaboration with the Longevity Center. But it's really great to hear you today talk about 
the, uh, neurobiology and the importance of maintaining a healthy lifestyle uh, to, um, to affect neural stem cell populations. So uh, I'm very excited to hear your talk today. Great, thank you. So let's jump right into it. I'm gonna keep this talk brief so that we can have more of a conversation afterwards and be able to address some of your questions. And it's also gonna be focused predominantly on some of the seminal work that were done in animal models uh, to really study how uh, lifestyle, believe it or not, lifestyle habits can affect neural stem cells. And it's difficult um, to do these kinds of studies in humans, right? Because you need a live human being, but at the same time, you need to be able to look into their brains. And that's not really an easy thing to do, which is why a lot of the foundational work for neural stem cell studies have been in very concrete and uh, well-made animal models. And that's what we will talk about. So just a quick word about the brain first. Um, so the brain weighs about three pounds on average. Um, and yet surprisingly, it consumes 20 to 25% of the body's energy. So it's a small organ. And yet, as we can probably uh, imagine, it, it needs a lot of resources to function. It is made up of a hundred billion neurons and uh, even more trillions of synapses, which I'll show you in just a second, just so you have a visual for what these things look like. Uh, but it's also made up of what are called glia, which um, are really just another way of saying support cells for the rest of the body, uh, for the rest of the brain, anything that can really help the brain to function better. But we also have a bunch of synapses. Think of these as sort of the highways of the brain that make connections with other neurons and just communicate with one another this way. Now, what does this actually look like? Well, um, if you take a look at this sort of, you know, depicted schematic video, if we were to look directly into the brain, can you see the video, by the way? I can't remember if I, okay, good. Um, you can see the connections, right? You can see these electrical signals that are going down from each axon, these long things that you see right here um, into the cell body of the neuron and that's how they're carrying messages. And this is how really we're able to function. This is why I can talk to you. I can see you, I can hear you, I can walk. All of the functions of the body are happening because of this communication across the synaptic pathways or these networks within the brain. But what we're focusing on today, and by the way, you can change these highways. That's a concept called neuroplasticity. You can, uh, the brain is, is plastic. You can make these highways connect to different, different routes uh, through, again, a lot of lifestyle habits. But one of the things that's really fascinating about the brain, and, and for a long time there was debate about, was whether or not you can also make brand new brain cells, because that's different from reconnecting the highways, right? This is, can, can I even make any, any new cells after I'm born or through adulthood? And that's what we call neurogenesis, which is really the birth of new neurons, right? Genesis being creation and neuro being brain, anything brain related. What's interesting is that the dogma for a very long time, for almost a century, was that after birth, the mammalian brain contains a finite number of neurons, and these neurons cannot replicate, and they can't regenerate themselves if they're damaged. And this really came from some of the foundational work done by a scientist known as Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who believed in 1928, believed in this concept so much. And of course he was a scientist, right? He was looking at brain images. And at that time there were no microscopes or fancy cameras to take pictures of things. So he would hand draw um, a lot of what he would observe about the brain after damage. And he found no brain cells able to regenerate. And so with full conviction and belief in this dogma, he put this on his tombstone and said, in adult centers, the nerve paths are something fixed, ended, immutable, everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. Quite, quite a statement to make on your tombstone. <laughs> but uh, what's interesting and in some ways scary, if you think about it, is if this were true, 
what would be the effect of a lot of things that we do to ourselves in terms of our lifestyle habits that could cause the death of our neurons, including, for instance, alcohol. And that's one area where there has been a lot of studies where we know, for instance, if you look at the brains of control patients or control subjects, healthy subjects, and compare those to the brains of alcoholics, people who consume a lot of alcohol, you see a significant difference in terms of cell death. So what you're looking at here is a marker for cell death. And that's an indication to us that with increased exposure to alcohol, we're losing brain cells. And if Ramon y Cajal was right, and we were never gonna get in those brain cells back, we would be in a lot of trouble because over time, we're, our brain is essentially degenerating and obviously at a faster pace if we're consuming too much alcohol. Now, hopefully none of us fall into this category, but for sure, all of us have experienced stress. And one of the other categories that we know for a fact has an effect on what we call neural stem cells, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a second, is actually stress. And these studies have been done on um, animals, on rat pups, who get very stressed out if you expose them to an unfamiliar odor. You can do that by, for instance, taking the pup and moving it away from his or her mom and putting them in a different cage, which is very stressful for them uh, in terms of odor or just exposure to an odor they're not familiar with. So one of the studies that I'm gonna show you today um, has been done using fox urine. Interesting that they picked that, but they put fox urine in the cage of these rat pups and this unfamiliar odor was one of the reasons why these animals were stressed out. And what you see when you compare, again, in this case, we're looking at cell division. How many cells in the brain are dividing? When you compare a control pup versus one that was exposed to this unfamiliar odor, you see a decrease in these dark circles here, which are indicative of cell division. You can quantify that number and you see that there's a statistically significant difference. So animals that were in the control group had higher amounts of cells dividing in their brains and those uh, exposed to the unfamiliar odor had less of those cells. So the combination of all of this tells us that there is definitely something negative about stress and alcohol on the brain. Thankfully, in around uh, 94, we found out uh, through the work of uh, Rusty Gage at UC San Diego that the adult rodent brain actually contains a population of cells called neural stem cells. And these cells are sitting in a very specific region of the brain. They're sitting in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus and they're sitting in the subventricular zone of the brain. Now, these are just fancy words. You don't need to remember what these regions are, but I'll tell you why these two regions are important in just a second. The, the, the real takeaway from all of this was though that the brain is capable of neurogenesis. So Cajal was wrong. It's not that when, we, uh, when we're born or uh, as an adult, we have a certain number of brain cells that we're gonna lose them and never regain them. No, there's a possibility for us to actually generate or even increase uh, significant uh, neurogenesis. Now this went on from 94 up until 2018 when this debate got reignited all over again. As you can see here, I've shown you snapshots of two different papers that came out um, in two very reputable journals, almost within two weeks of one another, showing exactly opposite results. <laughs> one suggesting that the human hippocampus uh, can continue to regenerate throughout aging, and the other saying that it drops sharply in children and it's undetectable by the time you're an adult. And I won't bore you with all the details of this. Um, obviously there was a lot, and still is, a lot of debate about which of these papers is more valid. What I will tell you is that after having evaluated all of the data here, I sit in the camp of the first paper. Um, and of course there are now different camps of scientists, but um, I'm much more convinced by the data presented in this paper. And therefore I come from the, and everything that we're gonna talk about today comes from the assumption that uh, the human brain is capable of neurogenesis. 
So if that's the case, how do we maintain or increase these neural stem cell pools? And why is it even important? Why should I care that my neural stem cell pools continue to increase? Well, it's important because these two regions, and especially this region, the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, is involved in learning and memory. This is the very place in the brain that is mediating a lot of the functions that we need in order to learn new tasks, in order to remember things. It's also one of the first areas of the brain that undergoes degeneration during cognitive decline. So if we can maintain more neural stem cell pools here, that suggests that we can increase longevity, aging, and of course, um, have better outcomes in terms of learning and memory. And my contention to you today, and I'm just going to focus on one of them, but hopefully we'll talk about others as we converse, um, is that exercise is one of the most powerful weapons that we have for both protecting our existing neuro neural stem cells and for regenerating the brain even more so than, uh, than we have. I'm going to share two papers with you that have shown this in animal models. Um, one of them, which is a very important one, this is sort of the beginning of the exercise and neurogenesis field in 99. And um, what this study did was it took two different sets of animals, one that had access to a running wheel, kind of like a hamster wheel in the cage, and the other was the normal cage. And then they, um, they allowed, obviously, these guys to run voluntarily whenever they wanted, but these guys weren't exercising. Then they put both of these groups under testing in a water maze task. And this is a task where, think of it as sort of like a pool of water that you put the animals into. There is um, a hidden platform in this water maze. And, um, you know, mice, rats, they don't really like water. So when you put them in, they're going to swim around until they find that platform and they sit on it. That's, that's where they're happy. So you put the animal in the water. It swims around the first time until it finds the platform. If it has learned where the platform is, the next time that you put the animal in the same spot, it should go directly to the platform right? It should learn over time. It should get better and better. So you shouldn't see all these winding paths before the animal lands on the platform. And then of course you can do other, uh, other physiological and histological analyses. We won't get into those today. Uh, but this study wanted to look at whether or not running will increase neurogenesis um, or neuroprotection, which is maintaining whatever neurons we have in the brain. And what they showed um, as a result of their study, so if you look at this graph um, on the left-hand side, you're looking at the runners and the, and the closed circles and the control group and the open triangles. And what you can see is that the runners very quickly after, after six days, actually much more quickly than that, within about two days of training, on the third day, they are finding the platform much more quickly. They're not swimming. This is the distance of swimming, right, on the y-axis. They're not swimming all over the place before they find the platform. But the control group are actually, it's taking them longer. And even by the six-day time point, there's a difference in terms of how long it takes for the runners versus the control group to find the hidden platform. Um, and this corroborates the data up here by showing how long it takes them. This is the path it takes the animals and this is how long it takes them. And again, it takes the runners much less time to find the platform. Um, you can also look at this a different way uh, by looking at the time spent and the quadrant with the platform. This is the quadrant with the platform. And you can see that the runners again are spending the most amount of time in the quadrant with the platform, suggesting that they found it faster and they were able to sit on top of it. Now, this was great. This suggested running has an effect on neural stem cells, but it was just the memory component. What about the actual brain? Well, the scientists took out the brains of these animals after the study was over, and they looked specifically at the number of cells that are dividing in the brain. These represent the neural stem cell population. So you're looking here at the red dots. And as you can see, the red dots for the runner group are much higher than those in the control group. There's only a few here. 
um, suggesting that running also increases the number of neural stem cells in the brain. So it's not just, you know, we're not just using memory as a surrogate. Now, this study got extended at the next level to now look at a number of different things. So in this, in the second iteration, the, um, the scientists took a control group who were sedentary. That's sort of like what they look like here in panel C. Um, and then you had, uh, don't worry about the learners for now, but you had a, a different group. You had a group of swimmers. They asked, what if, is it, an, is it a running specific effect? Do you have to run to have this neural stem cell population? Um, or can you swim? And the swimmers were forced to exercise. There was the running wheel group again, just like before. But they also added another group that was exposed to an enriched environment. And that looked something like this. They had all sorts of toys and tubes and things that they could walk through and, and be engaged with. And the study lasted for 12 days long and the results were fascinating. So what they found is that, uh, first of all, to orient you on the y-axis, we're looking at the number of dividing cells in the brain. What they found is that one day um, after, after the last session, that, uh, so think of it as like the 13th day of the study, uh, the study itself was 12 days, the runners, had the most amount of dividing cells in, the, in their brains, more so than any other group, right? So this would suggest to us that there's something really amazing about running, even more so than swimming, that is causing these cells to divide. But what was really fascinating was that if you waited four weeks later and took a look at the brains then, you would find very comparable effects with runners and those in the enriched environment. So those are the guys with all the toys and you know tubes and things. Still not with the swimmers, just the runners and the enriched environment. And this is a prolonged effect, right? So running may have a really rampant effect immediately after exercise um, on neural stem cell populations, but certainly by a, a more, a, you know, beyond that transient threshold four weeks later, both running and the enriched environment are having an effect on neural stem cells. I'm, I'm gonna leave it here because I'm sure we'll talk about a lot of this um, in just a second. I just wanna conclude. Um, so I, I just showed you evidence for running and maybe in a biased manner, I focus just on running, um, having an effect on neural stem cell populations, but Suffice it to say, there are tons of literature and tons of studies that are showing potentially other uh, lifestyle factors that could affect neural stem cell populations. These include uh, stress reduction. So this, um, uh, among some of those factors are mindfulness and breathing exercises, diet, dietary habits, and um, some of the key components that have been studied both in human, humans and animal models are um, caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, which I'm sure we can tackle if you haven't heard of, and the Mediterranean diet that most have probably heard of. Uh, physical activity to be differed from exercise, by the way. So again, really interesting conversation there. Um, and intellectual stimulation. So these are some other factors, and, and I'm sure there are many more. Um, we just don't have time to go through them all, but these are some of the factors that I just wanted to leave you with. And um, with that, I will end my talk here so that we can actually talk and answer some questions. Wow, well, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Hushmanda. I have like so many questions. But we want to leave some time for the audience too. But I do have a question about that last study where it was the swimming versus the running. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that they didn't find a difference between those two conditions? Yeah, so I can tell you the first time I saw that data, I was actually not only surprised, but in some ways disappointed because <laughs> I was really hoping, I actually used to be a swimmer myself and I was hoping that swimming would have very similar, it shouldn't matter what kind of exercise you do. 
So what's very interesting about that study, and I don't know if, if everyone was able to pick up, because I mean, obviously I went very fast, but remember the runners were being asked to run on a voluntary basis, mm -hmm. right? Right. They had access to the running wheel. They could run whenever they wanted, jump on it and, and run. The swimmers were forced to swim. Mm -hmm. And I also mentioned that uh, rodents don't like water. So mm -hmm. water for them is actually stressful. And so the hypothesis, the uh, working hypothesis here is that um, swimmers, in this case, for, for, for rodent models, um, swimmers are too stressed out. And this really suggests, it highlights a really, really important point that I'm glad you brought up, that the effect of, uh, the effect of stress could counteract the positive effects of exercise, mm -hmm. right? If, if you're under too much stress, the negative effects you could have from that would not even be able to compete with the positive effects of exercising on the brain, which is fascinating. And it really suggests how important it is to, to mitigate stress. Right. It, it also makes me think about depression because, you know, in, in some of those studies where they, they would do learned helplessness studies, mm -hmm. I'm remembering correctly, going back to like my early psych training, didn't they, have rodents swim until they kind of like gave up because they couldn't find the platform and they they would use that as a model of depression in in yeah. rodents. Yes, absolutely. And that's that's still, I mean, you you can very commonly see that if you allow, if you put these animals in water long enough. I don't even know if uh, animal protocols allow for things like that anymore, but yeah, <laughs> if you put that's them in true. Water Back in the enough, day, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, they do, they do lose hope, and and that's uh, that, that again, it highlights the important role of stress. Yeah, so that's stress. extremely. I mean, that's really that's revealing just in and of itself in that one study. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to people. Um, what I was, uh, I think I took a few notes while, while you were um, talking and can you tell us a little bit, I've heard a lot about caloric restriction and living longer. Can you address that? Uh, a little yeah, bit? absolutely. That's a really, uh, really popular topic nowadays. And um, maybe one of the first, um, well, actually one of the first human studies that was done on caloric restriction came out of UCLA um, from one of the UCLA scientists who, it was just him and a couple of his uh, graduate students or postdocs who um, went into a two-year quarantine, essentially, to do a very strict caloric restriction regimen and showed that by the time they came out of this quarantine, they had significantly diminished levels of uh, pro, what we call pro-inflammatory molecules in their bodies, which really just meant that inflammation was reduced as a result of their caloric restriction. Um, their study came after a series of studies that were done in Wisconsin using primates. And some of those primate studies are absolutely fascinating. I mean, even when you look at the differences between the images of, for instance, primates who have been on a caloric restriction diet versus non-caloric restriction, you can see changes even in their physical. I mean, their, you know, their facial hair is different. They, the, the ones who were not on the caloric restriction look older. Um, and there is also a significant amount of uh, literature about the effect of caloric restriction on, on disease, especially cancer and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So we know for a fact that there is uh, an association at minimum between caloric restriction and health. Um, what's interesting about the connection between caloric restriction and uh, the brain is that the mechanism is most likely very similar to what I described the UCLA scientist uh, as. Um, it's a reduction in inflammation. When you reduce, and, and it makes a lot of sense, right? Think about it. If we're constantly eating, or, or not even constantly, if we're just eating more than we really, the body really needs, what happens? The body needs to metabolize that food. Mm -hmm. 
And metabolizing is work. And when the body works, it generates waste. I mean, it's a machine, right? It's a pretty effective and productive machine, but it still generates waste. And so if we're eating all the time and asking the body to be working all the time to metabolize this food, then it's generating a lot of waste. And that waste is going to affect systemically everything in the body, including brain cells. And that's kind of the foundation behind the intermittent fasting regimen as well. Yeah. In fact, you know, you hear people who've, who've lost weight will tell you that they have more energy. Um, they actually feel better. Yeah. Way. Most people. Yeah. yeah. And they say they're sharper. Sharp. You know, I mean, it's, it's a subjective too. anecdotal yeah. um, report, but a lot of people will report that they feel like their brains are just sharper and more alert. And that's yeah. also probably an effect of just reduced intake of calories or food. <laughs> now, being, being a runner, an aging runner, um, who doesn't want to give it up and probably I'll be doing little baby steps out there in a few years and I don't care is <laughs> I think about, you know, the health, my health, but what is it about running that makes it good for this particular, you know, situation of, of stem cell? Is it the cardiac? Is it God forbid the pounding? What, what is it about running or do people know what it is about running that makes it so beneficial for, um, for stem cell, possibly uh, neurogenesis? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure that it is a running specific effect. Mm -hmm. It only shows up in running in these rodent studies. Okay. But if you look at um, humans, the, the key factor here is exercise. Now it could be running, it could be swimming, it could be anything else that, that mm -hmm. we're doing. But there's something about exercise that okay. is promoting uh, the production of a lot of, and, the, and there are, and there is a lot of evidence for this. There's something called BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor that is produced in the brain. It's actually produced in the, in blood as well, but it's also produced locally in the brain. And if you take, um, if, if you take samples from blood, even from runners, uh, not runners, uh, sorry, uh, exercisers, anyone who exercises versus those that don't, you will find an increase in the plasma levels of their BDNF, which tells us that it really doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're exercising, there's this increase and in this amazing trophic factor. Trophic factor just basically means that say it's food for the food, right? Food for mm -hmm. the brain in this case. Uh, there's this increase in, in this food and it really is irrelevant whether you're walking, running, swimming, it's, it, all that matters is that you're moving um, and you're doing some sort of a, of at least what, what's categorized as moderate activity, moderate level activity. And that is what in, in, your, in your experience, what's moderate? Like what would somebody listening today, what should they be thinking about if they're trying to determine if they exercise moderately? So the, um, the World Health Organization uh, has a standard for moderate exercise being 30 minutes per day. And it should be theoretically, I mean, even five days a week is mm -hmm. sufficient for exercise. You don't need to, you don't need to be doing it every day. Uh, but moderate exercise is 30 minutes a day. Um, and you also, you, you have to maintain your heart rate at a very specific zone. You don't want your heart rate to go too high up into their different levels or categories of heart rate. You don't want it to shoot too high up into the high intensity zone. You obviously don't want it to be too low where it's close to your resting metabolic rate. You want it to be in that sort of sweet spot where it's hard for you to talk, right? That the talk right. test is great. Um, and uh, you're huffing and puffing, but you're not totally out of breath. That's, okay. that's where you want to be. Okay, great. Yeah, that's really helpful to know. Um, another thing that struck me, and, and I'm going to get to some questions in a minute. They're, they're piling up. Is, <laughs> okay, I, I got to ask this. We hear when it comes to alcohol, especially wine, we hear, you know, a glass of red wine a day, if you're a woman, two, if you're a man, that's okay. But now we're hearing alcohol is damaging or could be to 
neurogenesis. Yep. Would you so, reconcile those? How things? do you reconcile that? That's the million dollar question. Exactly. So um, remember, first of all, the, the data I showed today were from alcoholics, right? So that was increased exposure to alcohol. Um, so that's one caveat to keep in mind. But secondly, the beneficial effects of wine, and we're talking specifically red wine, right? We're not talking oh. about white wine. We're not talking about hard liquor. We're talking about red wine here that has been recommended by um, the, I think, a lot of physicians in, in the heart space. The recommendation there comes from the effect of red wine on heart, heart disease. Mm -hmm. And um, that is actually, mm, it's not because of the wine, it's because of what's in the wine, which are, which are these phenols. And those phenols you can get from eating grapes, <laughs> you can get them from eating uh, blueberries, it doesn't have to be wine. And the other component now on the flip side, what you have to keep in mind is alcohol is alcohol is alcohol. If I, if I take alcohol and put it in the lab, put it on top of neural stem cells in a dish, it will kill those cells right away. That's just alcohol, right? So the effect of that alcohol on my brain cells remains those brain cells are going to be affected by alcohol exposure, but you will get the positive benefits of phenols for the heart when you're talking about uh, red wine specifically. So the way I personally reconcile this, although I don't drink at all. So for me, this isn't really something I think about all the time, but I know a lot of people do. They enjoy their glass of wine at night. And I think the way you should reconcile it for yourself is limit and minimizing the amount of alcohol intake. And there's lots of studies. There was a study done by Claudia Kawas at UCI, the 90 plus study. And I think she actually just recently finished her 100 plus study um, that has also suggested that minimizing intake, there have been correlations about minimizing alcohol intake on longevity. The populations who are drinking less than those who are you know, drinking on a regular basis live longer. Hmm. Okay. So we heard it here. <laughs> that, that actually, you know, helps a lot. This question comes up quite a bit. How much is too much, et cetera. I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I have a question from Judy. She said, what about intermittent fasting? So we were talking about caloric restriction. What about First of all, what does that mean? And what effects does that have? Yep, so intermittent fasting is a relatively new concept. And it's the idea that um, the body should really only be consuming food for certain windows of time. And these windows of time are uh, dynamic for, it's not the same for everyone. You pick a certain window of time. It could be eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, but you only eat during that window. And it could be during the day, it could be at night. Um, the premise here is that you want a certain amount of time during the day when your body is going into a fasting mode. So all you do is drink water, water is okay, certain other like black coffee is okay, but nothing that would increase your insulin levels. And um, so everything else is pretty much off the table during the fasting period. Wow. There are different philosophies on um, how many or which paradigm works most efficiently. Should you be fasting for eight hours or 10 hours or 12 hours? Um, I think a lot of that is being worked through in the literature now, but um, certainly there's a good amount of evidence to suggest that fasting is beneficial. Um, it's beneficial for the purpose of producing or reducing these um, inflammatory molecules in the body. So that's, that's been what's been shown in both uh, rodents and humans, actually. Okay. Okay. So... So even, so even if you're not counting calories, you sh it's a good idea to fast? Yep, yep. Okay. It's, its effects are actually um, completely separate from, from the caloric intake. Okay, all right, that's very helpful. Um, Aviva asked about 
we, we were talking about exercise in general is good. But she's asking if there are other kinds of exercise specifically and, you know, does it matter if it's cardio versus, suppose you do weight training, but you get your mm -hmm. weight up, for example. Yeah, um, it, it's a very good question. Um, I don't know that we know the effect of aerobic versus anaerobic exercise on neural stem cells, mm -hmm. but we definitely know that anaerobic exercise, anything that produces more muscle mass in the body is important for other stem cells in the body. For instance, your muscles also start to atrophy as you age right? right so including anaerobic exercises like lifting weights yoga anything that is sort of weight related um, is also very important for maintaining muscle mass which then also affects the maintenance of uh bone bone density um, and that, as you know, I'm sure we all know over time, you know, becomes a major problem in the older right. population, osteoporosis, so. osteoarthritis, all of those become challenging. Um, so the magic bullet is really a combination of both aerobic and anaerobic exercise. Mix it up, probably mix it up a little bit or vary your, your, uh, workout. Then. Exactly. Probably. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked, speaking of alcohol, what about marijuana? Is there any, are there any data on uh, the effects of marijuana um, on, on stem cell or to your knowledge, brain, well, brain, there's stuff coming out on brain health. Sure. Right, right. Yeah, I think, I believe, I, I'm not too familiar with uh, the literature on brain health related to marijuana. Maybe you know more and can speak to that. I don't believe we know enough about the effect of marijuana on neural stem cells. I don't know that there have been studies done uh, in that area. But of course, as, as you probably know, marijuana has other beneficial effects like reduction of pain um, that obviously mm -hmm. suggests it has some sort of an effect on the brain. Uh, we also know sure. it relaxes us, mm -hmm. so obviously it affects the brain. Uh, what we don't know is how it may affect uh, neural stem cells. Okay. Uh, another important topic that comes up, and and I know this is like really, really important towards mood, towards cognition, towards inflammation, is sleep. Mm. Do we know how sleep can affect stem cells, neural stem cells? Sleep is extremely important for cognitive function. Um, and there are numerous studies that have shown deprivation of sleep can make you in terms of cognitive functioning can make you the equivalent of somebody who is drunk i mean no joke one night right 24 hours of sleep deprivation will cognitively make you as impaired as somebody with a blood uh, with a blood alcohol content of uh, more than 0 0.08 so it definitely affects the brain uh, the question is, to what extent is it going to affect the neural stem cell populations? And again, uh, human studies on these things just haven't been possible, right? It's not practical to do them. So um, we, don't, we don't know that effect on uh, humans just yet. But mm -hmm. I, I would be willing to bet that it has sleep deprivation has a detrimental effect mm -hmm. on neural stem cells. Is there any way to image uh stem cells or can you do any kind of staining at autopsy for stem cells in humans you can't you can't look at individual cells um in in humans but what you can do as a surrogate which is where i'm getting a lot of my sort of hypotheses about these things is mri scans so for instance the mindfulness uh that i described earlier about the effect of mindfulness on neural stem cells wasn't a study that was done on humans looking at their neural stem cell populations but it was a study done on humans looking at mri scans of their hippocampus and the thickness of the hippocampus and what they showed was that after an mbsr program a mindfulness-based stress reduction program you get individuals who have thicker hippocampus than those who were in the control group and did not do any sort of meditation. 
and an increase in thickness of the hippocampus is suggestive of cells that have regenerated, right? We can't find mm-hmm. those individual cells, but right. indirectly we can say that there are more of them now. I see, okay. Now is that, how does that relate to brain plasticity? Plasticity is different and that okay. you can look at by changes in the function of the brain and how th- those can be done in fMRI scans and some CT scans to look at how the connections between the, the different uh, parts of the brain are being conducted, which is different from looking at the thickness of right. the brain. Right. So uh, is stem cell, you know, is neurogenesis, stem cell neuro and neurogenesis, are they related to neuro- neuroplasticity? Yeah. Uh, not directly, because neurogenesis okay. is the birth of these new neurons. Right. And neuroplasticity is the rewiring of existing neurons. Now, of course, when a neuron is born, at some point, it's going to have to make connections. So right. it's going to make those. Um, and that once that connection is made, those connections could be rerouted again. So eventually down the line, a brand new cell could go through neuroplasticity. Uh, but the two concepts are, you, you have to think of them sort of separately. Okay. Yeah. All right. That, that makes sense. We're getting a lot of really interesting questions about neuroplasticity, et cetera. So I'm trying to address some, um, Here's another great question. What specifically is it about stem cells that are affected by exercise? Like are more created? Does it increase their their functioning, their efficacy of functioning? Um, How does that work or do we know how that works? Uh, We have some ideas. Um, One of those, like I said earlier, is the production of this this food or trophic factor that I mentioned, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor that as a result of exercise is uh, produced locally in the brain. And when you make more of this brain-derived neurotrophic factor, you're providing more food to the brain cells and therefore those cells are able to divide more. Uh, We also know that another potential mechanism is blood flow. Uh, Exercise increases blood flow, right? Because you're you're moving, so there's more blood circulating. And part of that blood is obviously going to the brain. And what does blood have in it? It has nutrients and it has oxygen. So when you deliver more of that to the brain, it causes your brain cells to regenerate even further. Uh, We also know that exercise reduces inflammation, like I said. So by reducing inflammation, it's giving an opportunity to those cells to be able to do their job better, to first of all, not die. And secondly, Mm -hmm. to be able to use the resources that they have to continue regenerating. So lots of different working hypotheses, but these are, uh, these are some of the, some of the more uh, fundamental ones that have been shown. We don't have a lot of time left, but I would like to address something that's really near and dear to the longevity center's heart uh, and and a lot of people's hearts and minds is neurodegenerative diseases and Alzheimer's disease, you know, Parkinson's, uh, ALS, multiple sclerosis. And how can stem cells be used or is there any research on the horizon, any findings that could possibly uh, inform treatment for people with neurodegenerative diseases? Yeah, so this this is what I love talking about because what I did at at UCLA and what I'm still continuing to do is um, educating people about the potential impact of stem cell research and how mm-hmm. important it is to, to continue investing in our science uh, of regenerative medicine. Um, I think we can address your question in two ways. One is what we can do to reduce degeneration in some cases where we can right? Because not everything is in our control. Some things are, we're we're genetically predisposed to, or maybe genetically predisposed to getting, like Parkinson's could be very much related to genetics, although there could be uh, other environmental factors related to it. 
but at least for the parts that are within our control, we can really try to adapt, adopt a lot of these lifestyle factors that we just talked about. So that's the part to try to prevent or delay the mm -hmm. onset of neurodegeneration. But the other uh, side of this coin is now, what if somebody is suffering from a neurodegenerative disease and are there ways in which stem cells can help them? And um, there are a lot of people studying this. There are many labs who are transplanting stem cell populations, right. either directly into the brain or through injections through the vein. Um, or all sorts of other, other methods to, by which they are hypothesizing that the new stem cell population that you deliver to the patient is going to replace the dead cells, the lost cells. Mm -hmm. So if, for instance, you're suffering from Parkinson's disease and you've lost your dopaminergic neurons, is there a way that you can deliver dopaminergic stem cells to the brain of the Parkinsonian patients and have those be the replacement for the lost cells. And can the new dopaminergic neurons now, you know, make, produce more dopamine and therefore mm -hmm. uh, show a recognizable effect. And, and there are clinical trials of this right now ongoing right. in Canada and US. So are those stem cells engineered uh, to be prone to turn into dopaminergic uh, neurons or how does that work? They, some people can engineer them, but there are others, like the one that I'm thinking of in particular is, um, is a clinical trial that's taking skin cells. Like I can literally do a skin biopsy and give you some skin cells and you could take those skin cells, reprogram them, basically erase their memory about the fact that they were skin and make them into dopaminergic neurons. So you first actually have to turn them back all the way to the level of a stem cell that's getting technical, but then eventually make them into dopaminergic neurons. And now you can take those dopaminergic neurons and put those into, into my own brain. If I have Parkinson's disease, you can put those back into my own brain. And the benefit of that is that they're still my cells, right? My genetic mm -hmm. markers. Um, so the odds of rejection are much lower and you put those back and you hope that those cells can replace the dying cells. Do you know if they're doing any of this kind of work for Alzheimer's disease? They are. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. There are tons of studies that are in the works for Alzheimer's using a variety of different cell types. Um, I don't, I can't think of a clinical trial off, clinical trial being in humans off the top of my head, uh, right now for Alzheimer's disease, but for sure there are works, um, in animal models in, that in are the animal models. getting prepared for clinical trials. Yeah. One of the things that I read about that is that, um, and I don't, I don't know what your opinion is or how often this happens, but that if you take a nice young, <laughs> by definition, stem cell, and you put it into an old diseased environment, does that affect the ability of that stem cell to, you know, become whatever you want it to become? Like, does it affect its survival, its function? Because that, that I read in the literature has been a kind of a, a, an obstacle or a concern in some studies, animal studies. Yeah, yeah. So there, there were, um, at some point, there were some concerns about that. But the first thing is, I, I, and I find even more fascinating than this, is um, in the early 2000s, there was a group from Berkeley and later on UCSF um, who were doing these experiments called parabiosis. I don't know if you've heard of them, where they take two animals, a young one and an mm -hmm. old one, and they essentially join these animals right. through their bloods. Right. So now yep. the blood of the young animal is going into the old, the blood of the old animal is going into the young. And what they found was that the young blood was causing the old animals to perform better on learning and memory tasks. It was um, increasing longevity, increasing lifespan. I mean, there, were, there was definitely something in the young blood that was very special. And it suggested that there is some, you know, there are mechanisms that are happening in, in blood, at least, that are uh, detrimental as, as we get yeah. older and, and we age. 
Um, a lot of these studies are still being unpacked by uh, scientists to figure out what is it in blood <laughs> that causes this. Uh, but certainly there does seem to be an effect um, of wow. young versus, you know, old blood. That's, that's incredible. It, it's very sci-fi. Uh, it is. <laughs> I, I saw that scenario in a Vincent Price movie once. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing the, the things that, you know, um, that you can learn from, from actually performing these types of experiments, you know, and there is a big jump from animals to human, but it really does give us hope that there are treatments on the horizon for, and I know you did your work in spinal cord injury. So it's much more than just neurodegenerative diseases. I think even uh, diabetes is another um, oh, yeah. area of great uh, research with cells. So it's yep, yep. fascinating and I'm sure there'll be more on the horizon. Absolutely. It's 5.02 and I cannot thank you enough for being here today, Dr. Hushman. We could talk another hour minimum. I'm no, sure we could. No wine though, no, no wine. <laughs> but um, but uh, it's been fantastic. And uh, I wanna thank you for coming here today. And thank you for being part of our, you know, volunteering your time and your, your wisdom and knowledge at the, uh, Longevity Center for the Senior Scholars Program, and which is a cognitive enrichment program, along with yep. our memory training. And that's what we're about here, is to really provide lifelong education, lifelong learning for older adults, and lifestyle, uh, new, you know, research updates, and really live better longer, which is our motto. And, um, and thank you for talking about that today. Really appreciate you having here. And thank you to Andy uh, Talakowski who reached out to you and did this relationship. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's a pleasure always to see the senior scholars so interested. There's, you know, I always tell them every time I uh, meet up with the senior scholars, I tell them that this is, there's nothing better you can do for yourself than right. to exercise or to take these classes. I mean, this concept of UCLA allowing senior scholars to take classes and stay intellectually engaged is the equivalent of that enriched environment that we talked about. Right. So the fact right. that there, you know, the, this program is enabling such a thing and, and to see the senior scholars so interested and so engaged. I used to have... Uh, many of them in my classes, and I love them, uh, all of you who are listening. I mean, I think there is nothing better for a faculty member or, or a teacher of any kind than to have students who are fully engaged, and the senior scholars are truly engaged when they come into class. Yeah. They ask the best questions, and right. they take notes aggressively, and as, a, as an instructor, there's nothing more rewarding than that. So, it's amazing to be a part of the program and um, I congratulate you and um, Andy for such an amazing work that you've done with this. And I hope that um, it continues to propagate for a very, very long time because I have a lot, a tremendous amount of respect for it. And propagate is the exact word in, in the context of stem cell. <laughs> exactly. But thank you so much. And um, and good luck in your in your stem cell endeavors and uh, and um, people, thank you for tuning in today. We really appreciate it. You can find us on the web. We have a website. Google us or go right there to www.semel.ucla.edu/slash longevity, and that's where we live. So thank you everybody and have a great evening. And thank you again, Dr. Hushman. Have a great evening yourself. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.